Hello, Booktube. Well, we've come to it at last. The wreck of the Mary Deer. The fall of Gondolin. The final mail haul of the week. I've got a small pile of packages here, and after this, nothing. Nothing. The lone and level sands stretch far away. Uh, but let's go through it together one last time. <laughs> uh, starting with this little thing. What is this? Okay. Uh, okay. D did not request this. This is by Paisley Rekdal. Uh, and it comes out in mid-September. It's called The Broken Country. Uh, on trauma, a crime, and the continuing legacy of Vietnam. And Paisley Rekdal is the Poet Laureate of Utah. <laughs> Uh, this is uses the book uses a violent incident that took place in Salt Lake City, Utah, in 2012, as a springboard for examining the long-term cultural and psychological effects of the Vietnam War. To make sense of the shocking incident in which a young homeless man born in Vietnam stabbed a number of white men purportedly in retribution for the war, Paisley Rectile draws on a remarkable range of material and fashions and fashions it into a compelling account of the dislocations suffered by the Vietnamese and also by American-born veterans over the past decade. Huh. Okay. Huh. So she doesn't fashion it into a compelling account of a murder, of, of attempted murder. She fashions it into a compelling account of the dislocations suffered by the Vietnamese. Okay, well, uh, I, I didn't know anything about it. This is this is from uh, the University of Georgia Press. Uh, certainly intriguing enough to read. Uh, so let's uh, let's move on. That's an odd an odd start for the last mail hall ever. Uh, let's see what this next one is from the always reliable Pegasus Books. Oh, look at that. Okay, this comes out in February. Uh, and it is Stonehenge, the story of a sacred landscape by Francis Pryor. Uh, this advanced copy doesn't have much in the way of artwork. I, I can only assume from the shape of it that the finished copy will, 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 will pride itself on its artwork. Uh, let's see here. Perched on the chalk uplands of Salisbury Plain, the megaliths of Stonehenge offer one of the most recognizable outlines of any cultural structure. Its purpose, place of worship, sacrificial arena, giant calendar, is unknown. But its story is one of the most extraordinary of any of the world's prehistoric monuments. Constructed in several phases over the period of some 1,500 years, beginning in 3000 BC, Stonehenge's key elements are its blue stones, transported from West Wales by unexplained means, and its sarsen stones, quarried from the nearby Marlborough Downs. Oh, so this is, this looks like fun. Great. I have been to Stonehenge many times. Uh, never had a spiritual awakening there, but uh, I've known people who claim to. Uh, let's see. All right, so that's 2018, though. That, so that doesn't, that doesn't directly engage Steve today. Okay. All right, this is a, another... Uh, Another book I did not request. It comes out in late September. This is Savage Country by Robert Olmsted, which has a blurb from uh, Kirkus Reviews saying, Another gorgeous, brutal masterpiece from a great American writer uh, who is the author of eight previous books uh, that have won awards or been finalized, finalist, shortlisted for awards. He's the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and an, N an NEA grant and is a professor at Ohio Wesleyan University. And this book has a buffalo on the cover. Uh, the year was 1873 and all, about, and all about was the evidence of boom and bust, shattered dreams, foolish ambition, depredation, shame, greed, and cruelty. Summer's over, folks. <laughs> Onto this broken Western stage rides Michael Coughlin, a war, a Civil War veteran with an enigmatic past, come to town to settle his dead brother's debt. 
Together with his widowed sister-in-law Elizabeth, bankrupted by her husband's folly and death, they embark on a massive and hugely dangerous buffalo hunt. Elizabeth hopes to salvage something of her former life and the lives of the hired men and their families who now depend on her. The buffalo hunt that her husband had planned, she now realizes, was his last hope for saving the land. Huh. Okay. Uh, so, a western of a kind. I'm, I'm on board for that. <laughs> uh, odd that this is, this is a male hall so far entirely composed of stuff that I did not request. But almost almost makes me feel legitimate. <laughs> what is this next one? Oh, okay. This is the finished copy of something we saw already. Uh, this is Post -Crit Poet Critics and the Administration of Culture by Evan Kinley. What a cover. <laughs> it waits for us all. <laughs> this is from Harvard University Press, and it comes out, I'm sure, in September. Uh, yes, in, in September. Uh, and it, and it uh, brilliantly explores the relationship between the work of great 20th century poets and their growing, growing role as cultural arbiters. Uh, in this book, the author recognizes the major role modernist poet critics played in the transition from aristocratic patronage to technocratic cultural administration. Poet critics developed extensive ties to a network of bureaucratic institutions and established dual artistic and intellectual identities to appeal to the kind of audiences and entities that might support their work. Kindly, fo the author focuses on Anglo-American poets including T.S. Eliot, Marianne Moore, W.H. Auden, Archibald MacLeish, Sterling Brown. These artists grappled with the task of being village explainers, as Gertrude, Gertrude Stein described Ezra Pound. Keep in mind, she was mocking him. <laughs> so, huh. hmm. They grappled with the task of being village explainers and legitimizing literature for public funding and consumption. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, Open Letters Monthly, the literary journal where I am the managing editor, has a poetry person. Most of her poetry people are poets, but I don't, I don't know that many of them would be interested in a book like this. There, I don't think there's anything in here that they could call piercing and liminal. <laughs> so I'll, I mean, I'll float, I'll float the idea, but I have a feeling I'll end up dealing with it myself. Uh, and then this is our last one, the very last book. This is the last book ever. What will it be? 900 page biography of Erasmus, perhaps? Oh. <laughs> okay. All right. This is also from Harvard. This comes out in September. It is not a 900 page biography of Erasmus. It is the finished copy of something called End of Its Rope How Killing the Death Penalty Can, Death Penalty Can Revive Criminal Justice by Brandon Garrett, who is the Justice Thurgood Marshall, Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of Virginia School of Law. I was wondering if we were going to get through a whole video. With a, it's never going to happen, right? That's become clear in the last few weeks. That I am never going to make a video that doesn't have a wailing siren in it at some point. I, I, uh, I wish that I had the technical ability to make a little opener for the channel. I've never done it before in a year of making videos, but I would do one now of simply a wailing siren. Uh, because it, it, I just realized the other day that it's been months, maybe never, that I have made a silent video, except when I go into the forest. <laughs> huh. it's, it's the sort of thing you only notice when you're, when you're making videos, when you're just living your life, you tend not to notice it. I hadn't noticed before now that that is an absolutely omnipresent, every minute of every hour of every day sound in this house. The wailing, the desperate, screaming wailing of police sirens and ambulances. I had no idea until I started making these videos. Now I realize that one of them brings each of these videos to a halt. It is so loud. Uh, so as I've said, as I've said in earlier videos, it's a, it's a pretty clear indication. Now that I see that, it's a pretty clear indication that I need to move house. And that is just a nightmare. <laughs> I'll do it. Uh, but it's a nightmare. <laughs> Uh, so what do we got here? Uh, it isn't enough to celebrate the death penalty's demise. We must learn from it. When Henry McCollum was condemned to death in 1984 in rural North Carolina, death sentences were commonplace. In 2014, DNA tests set McCollum free. By then, death sentences were as rare as lethal lightning strikes. What changed? 
Brandon Garrett hand-collected and analyzed national data, looking for causes and implications of this turnaround. End of its rope explains what he found and why the story of who killed the death penalty and how can be a catalyst for criminal justice reform. Huh. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to disagree with this author quite a bit, but, uh, uh, but uh, that's okay. That will actually make for an invigorating reading experience, especially since I didn't get an advanced copy of this, so I haven't read it. Uh, I will I will disagree with almost every word of this, <laughs> but, but <laughs> still. Uh, so that's, and The End of Its Robe is a fitting title for the final book that we're ever going to have. So we have The End of Its Rope, about the, the death of the death penalty. We have Poet Critics and the Administration of Culture, which is a subtitle. It, the, this book actually is missing a title, and I, I once again stress, my, my services for, ta for titling books are available to the publishing industry 24-7 for free. Uh, but the poet, cr poet Critics and the Administration of Culture is a subtitle. The title is actually something else, something better, much better. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> and then Savage Country by Robert Olmsted, a, a Civil War Western, uh, a book on Stonehenge, uh, and a, the, a Vietnam book by the Poet Laureate of Utah, uh, all of which I did not request. So these, these are the, the last mail hall ever in the West uh, is full of surprises, <laughs> which is uh, kind of good. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up there, Booktube. It's been wonderful. <sighs> Maybe I'll see you again someday. <laughs> I'll have other things to talk about, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you, Booktube.